This morning, I want to start off with a question. What do you see in front of you? If you thought to yourself or said out loud, an empty chair, then congratulations, you're correct. Give yourself a pat on the back. But to us, an empty chair is never really an empty chair, right? For you, maybe an empty chair is an opportunity. Maybe you come home to an empty chair and you know that dinner's about to be served with your friends and your family. Or maybe an empty chair for you is an opportunity to sit down with your friends and to catch up and to talk life. Or maybe for you, an empty chair is an opportunity to take a quick four and a half hour power nap. But a chair is also a representation It can be a representation if you walk into work on Monday morning and you see that your boss is not sitting in his chair, you know that he's late or that he's not coming in. An empty chair can also represent the fact that maybe somebody is out and actually getting stuff done and being productive and they're not just sitting around. Maybe an empty chair is never really just an empty chair. Good morning, everybody. I'm so glad that you guys are with us today. My name is John, and we're going to be ending this series, The Invitation. Now, this whole series has been about inviting people in with us on Sunday mornings to experience some church. And we have been so glad, and it's been an awesome turnout. But let's say that you are, this is your first time, and you're new, or maybe you haven't been here for a while. I just want to give a quick recap of what this series has done. In week one, Kaiser gave an incredible message talking about how the identity of the people or the people that we identify for the message of Christ is not just for the people that we think. He talks about Jesus and the Samaritan woman at the well and how that was a cultural very uh, crossing. That was not something that was supposed to happen. This woman was not supposed to be at the well at that time, and even though she was, Jesus was not supposed to talk to her, but he did. And not only just talked to her, but he shared the gospel. He shared his name and his message. And she ended up getting her life transformed. And she went running back to her hometown and told everybody there who Christ was and what, she, and what he meant to her. Because the people we identify is not just for the people we think. The message of Christ is for everybody. In week two, Matt did an amazing job talking about, like Jesus, we should invest in people. You see, we're all built for community. We're all built to do life with others. And sometimes our community invests in us, right? Maybe in major life moments or major life decisions, your community, whatever that may look like for you, had some kind of influence over your decision. Whether if it was a job transition or maybe a relationship or maybe to go to school or to drop out of school. Your community invested in you and it reproduced something. So like Jesus, we should be investing in people. And this week, I want to give us our bottom line up front. A simple invitation can impact somebody's eternity. A simple invitation can impact someone's eternity. Now, I want to ask you a favor. Can y'all, real quick, just look around at the empty chairs next to you? There's a couple in here. At first glance, when we walk in, we might see a little bit of extra elbow room, right? a place to sit down and relax for big people like me. (laughs) Or maybe you see a place to lay your purse or your jacket so that way it's not sitting under your feet. Or maybe you see a place to put your child when you're done holding them. But you see, an empty chair is never really an empty chair, right? It's an opportunity and it's a representation of something. And in this series about inviting people in, our objective, the the goal is to try and fill these empty chairs, is to make an empty chair, turn it into an opportunity so that I can represent a transformed life. And you see, today we're going to talk about why we should do that, why we should be inviting others in, why we should be filling these empty chairs, and why it's an opportunity. And today we're going to look at a story that Jesus told that can be called the parable of the banquet. Now, the banquet, to give some cultural context, is not just some Sunday afternoon dinner. It is a massive feast. Sometimes it would go on for days and days, and in certain situations, even weeks. This was a big deal. It was a big event. It was a big dinner. 
And so Jesus is sitting down at some table with some Pharisees. And they're all, and he sees that they're all trying to like get up close to Jesus. They're fighting for that front row spot next to him because they know wherever Jesus goes, something big will probably happen. And Jesus sees this and he kind of rebukes them and he says, hey, hey, we, we don't need to fight for that. We don't need to fight for the front row seat. Actually, you should probably give it to somebody else. And you see, for us, that's something that can be understandable. Like, raise your hand if you've ever bought tickets to go to a concert and you had to fight somebody for the nosebleeds. One person, okay, here we go. <laughs> that's one out of hundreds. And so, that is something that we can understand. If you buy a concert ticket, you want the best seats possible, right? You want to be up close next to the stage. You want to be able to reach out your hand and have the artist or the performer give you a high five. You want the best memories. You want to be close to the action. You want to experience it in the best way possible. And that's what the people at this banquet dinner were doing. They were trying to get close up next to Jesus. Again, is understandable. And as Jesus rebukes them, there's one guy who understood what, it, what he was saying. He understood that, hey, this table is not meant for me, but it's for other people. And, he, and as Jesus looks around, he notices that not everybody else was quite grasping that thought. Because to them, to be invited to this special dinner meant that they were included. It meant that they were a part of that community, that they were a part of this secret uh, society that was like the best of the best. Because this dinner was not just for anybody. You had to get a special invitation to go to it. It not only meant that they were included, but that they were important. It meant that they had value for the community, that they valued their opinions and their, and their perspective on life. It meant that they were important, that they were valued, and that they belonged. That they belonged to that community. Have you ever wanted to be a part of a community where you felt important, included, and belonged? That's what these people, that was their preconceived notions about what this dinner meant. That it was something so special that it was only for the best of the best. And as Jesus is sitting here and he's kind of rebuking them, saying, no, that's, that's not what this is about. And the majority of them are not really understanding this. And so Jesus tells this parable. And he starts off by replying, a certain man was preparing a great banquet like the one we're sitting at and invited many, many guests. And at the time of the banquet, he sent his servant to tell those who had been invited, come, for the everything is now ready. Now to give some context, in verses 16 and 17, we see two invitations. The first invitation is kind of like a save the date for the wedding, right? You get that probably weeks in advance, maybe a month in advance, maybe a couple months that's what this verse 16 was. It was the save the date, here it comes. Verse 17 is because they didn't have iPhones and emails back then. They actually send out a second invitation the day of to say, hey, this is coming up in a couple of hours and we want you to be there. See you soon. All right, so that's what's going on. There are two invitations that just happened. And so the servant, in the next verse, the servant replies. And so he goes, I'm sorry, so he goes out and then he starts inviting all these special guests, this master, this parter, or this person who was going to throw the party, and he goes out and he says, but they all alike began to make excuses, excuses to not go to this banquet dinner. The first said, I have just bought a field and I must go and see it. Please excuse me. Another said, I have just bought five yoke of oxen and I'm on my way to try them out. Please excuse me. And still another said, I just got married, so I can't come. <laughs> You know this is a parable because no newlywed is going to turn down free dinner, okay? <laughs> so the servant comes back to his master. And he comes back and reports that everybody had made an excuse to cancel last minute, to not come. Then the owner of the house became angry and he ordered his servant, Go out quickly into the streets, into the alleys of the town, and bring the crippled, the blind, and the lame. And so the servant goes out, and he invites everybody right in his town, right in his immediate community. And he comes back, and he says, Sir, what you have ordered has been done, and there is still room at this banquet. And so the master told his servant, Go out into the country roads, and go out to the roads into the country lanes, and compel them to come in, so that, that my house will be full. I tell you, no one of these who were invited will get a taste of my banquet. So there's this big dinner, this big invitation, and the original guests decide to cancel last minute for some silly reasons. 
And so this master being angry and upset that he's prepared all this food, this massive opportunity, he says, okay, you know what? Uh, Go out and just invite everyone in. So the servant does. And he comes back and he says, "Uh, sir, I've done that and there's still plenty of room here. Master says, okay, go out to the people that we might not interact with a whole lot, out into the country lanes, into the roadsides, and come in and invite them in. So the servant does. Because this master knows that whoever comes to this banquet is going to leave full. That whoever was originally invited, if they decide to come up late, they're not going to get a taste of anything. Because this dinner, these banquets that Jesus is sitting at, is not like a uh, big buffet that you find at Golden Corral. This is um, Texas Day Brazil, Ruth's Chris level dinner, okay? This is like the best dinner that they might have in their life. And he knows, hey, these people who come, they're going to leave full. They're going to leave satisfied. So the sermon goes out, and they do. And he brings in everybody, as many people as he can. And so what Jesus is doing in this parable is he's drawing the correlation between the banquet dinner and what the kingdom of God looks like or what it should look like. You see, sometimes God calls us to be that servant. He calls us out to to invite everybody in. Sometimes it's through message series like this, and sometimes it's in the middle of your work day, and you you find yourself in a conversation, and that thought comes up to say, oh, I, I need to probably invite them to church this Sunday. Or maybe it's to share your faith, or to mention something about small group. And those are great thoughts. But sometimes we have thoughts that kind of like counteract those intentions, right? Maybe you you have this thought, and and it's a good thought, but then something comes up that says, oh, well, I've got a lot of work to do. This project, it's going to take me five days to get done, and I need all the time I can get to do it. Or maybe another thought that comes in is, you know, it's the end of the work day. I'll, I'll see them tomorrow. It's no big deal. Like, we both work in the same office. Or maybe you even get into a conversation, you have that notion, but you forget to bring it up. These are thoughts that I'm willing to bet that everyone has had. I know I have. In the grand scheme of things, after the situation, after we go home, if we were to think back on these situations where we had these thoughts of, I've got a lot of work to do, I'll see them tomorrow, I just forgot. In the grand scheme of things, they're, they're kind of silly, really. I mean, maybe they sound familiar of, hey, you know, I just bought this uh, do-it-at-home project, I've got to go and do it, sorry. Or, hey, you know, I've got to take care of my pets. Or maybe, you know, I'm a newlywed, I don't want free food. They're kind of silly, right? But if they're so silly, why do they, why do they override our intentions? Why do they override the, the core values that we as believers of Christ have? Well, I think it's because maybe of fear. Fear of how that other person will interpret us. Fear of being rejected. Fear of being unprepared for the conversation and and not knowing all the answers to all the questions that they could ask. Maybe it's being out of my comfort zone. Maybe you're a big extrovert and you love talking to people, but talking about your faith is just new. Or maybe you're an introvert and, and having conversations is something that you're just not a fan of. This is something that we all have gone through. This is something that we all have experienced and we've all had these thoughts, right? So how do we overcome that? How do we start to have those conversations? How do we overcome fear, being unprepared, and coming out of our comfort zone? It's by being authentic. To be authentic is to be real. It's not to put on some fake facade of who we are or some fake story of what we have experienced, but it's to be authentic. Because authenticity will always override timidity. Being authentic about your story will always shine through more than your fear will. If you're authentic and real about your experiences in being in a church community or about your experience in a relationship with Christ, it will always overcome being unprepared. If you're authentic and, 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 wor- and not worried, and you're focused on the, the story that you have for the mess, the story that you have for this person and for the message, it makes coming out of the comfort zone a little bit easier. Because being authentic will always override timidity. And you see, uh, there's this thing in life where we come up to those situations and and we want to be authentic, right? We want to be real. We want to invite them into a relationship or even invite them to church. But we don't know how to go about those conversations. Well, I want to encourage you, maybe 
If you didn't grow up in the church, you can probably remember a season of life where you were not a follower of Christ. Or maybe you're in that season right now. Maybe you're new in the faith, or maybe you're not, you wouldn't consider yourself a Christ follower. Can you remember those? For those who do follow Christ, can you remember those seasons? What the, what the style of life was, what the habits were, what the thought process and where the emotional stability was? In John 10.10, 10, Jesus is talking to a group of people, and he says, the thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. Now, I want to pause right there. How many times has this world stolen something from you? Stolen your, your joy, your happiness, maybe an opportunity from you. It was not super specific and intentional, but just life circumstances happened, and it stole something from you. How often do we have dreams and lifestyles and new habits that we want to get into place, but the world just due to life circumstances kind of kills those off? How often do we want to try and build something up for ourselves and to have a great opportunity, whether if it's a relationship with a family member or a business opportunity or you're trying to go to school and something happens and it just gets destroyed? How often does that happen in our world? I would beg to think that it's probably pretty normal. That this, the thief comes to only steal, kill, and destroy is a a routine lifestyle that's not surprising to an unbeliever. So Jesus continues on, and he says, I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. That I may come so that they may have life and have it to the full. This word full in the Greek can be translated a number of different ways. And this word full can be translated to abundant, to overflowing, to an excess, to an excess amount, to mean be able to share with others. When was the last time that you felt an abundant of life? When was the last time you had an abundance of joy that was just overflowing out of you? When was the last time we had an excess of an opportunity or of excitement or passion that we wanted to share with others? You see, when we step into a relationship with Christ, he does something in our hearts. He transforms our heart so that we might have life to the full, so that no matter when life comes and steals our hopes and our dreams or it kills off our opportunities or it just really demotes and destroys our outlook on life, that we might live life to the full, that it is important, that we might be able to overcome those situations, that we might be able to work through those situations because of our relationship with Christ. It is not because Christ makes life great and rainbows and sunshine. No, I'm sorry. Life is still going to happen, but it is through those situations that we might experience a full life and experience a full experience, full experience of life. And that is what we're inviting people to. When we're inviting people to come in with us on a Sunday morning, we are not inviting them to a social event. We're not inviting people to come on Sundays to have the great coffee and the mints out in the lobby, even though we do. We are not inviting people to hear a nice motivational message on stage, even though I hope you leave encouraged. We're not inviting people to hear great music, even though that is an aspect of our environment. We are inviting people in to hear the message of Christ crucified and Christ resurrected because that is the pinnacle of our faith. Without the crucifixion and without the resurrection, Christianity is no more. And it is through the resurrection, the resurrection, that we get this message of having life to the full, that we get this message of hope, that we get this message of healing and restoration. How many relationships have you had where it was broken, where it was tense? How many situations have you had where it was just super stressful? How many times have we had situations or or conversations where we walked away just kind of depleted? If you're anything like me, it's happened. What is through Christ that I have personally seen uh, relationships being restored to to overpouring joy and happiness and and contentment with each other. I have seen through a relationship with Christ somebody going at work who hated their job but came out on the other side after a relationship with Christ and they're now one of the top people in the company. I have seen people who have overcome drug addictions, who have overcome alcoholism, who have overcome abuse through a relationship with Christ. It is not because Christ makes the life or our world rainbows and sunshine, but it is through that, the transformation of our heart, that we get to experience this fullness of life. When we are inviting people into Sunday mornings, it is not a social event, but it is to experience a transformation and an opportunity of their heart. That is what we're inviting people to. 
That is what we are expecting to happen when we fill these empty chairs. We're not inviting people again to just sit down and to have a nice Sunday morning. We're sitting down to experience something transformational. And going back to our bottom line, a simple invitation can impact somebody's eternity. Simple invitation, something that we sometimes make just way overcomplicate, can impact somebody's eternity. And this word eternity can, can sometimes be a little fearful, right? That's, that's a big thought. And I think sometimes we as, as a Christian body will look at this word eternity and think that it starts at the end of life, right? It starts when we, when we start to transition into the next stage, when we, when we pass on. Well, that's not what eternity is, logically. Logically, eternity is forever. It is before our time and it's going to be after our time. So the thought is, is that we live in eternity right now and that one day we are going to go to heaven or we're not. And when we invite people into an, a relationship or into an opportunity to hear the message of Christ crucified and Christ resurrected, we are giving an opportunity for someone's eternity to be changed, to be impacted. We're giving the opportunity for somebody to feel restoration in their broken family. We are giving somebody an opportunity to hear the message of, of abuse turned into healing. We're giving somebody an opportunity that can take trauma and, and shame and turn it into joy, to joyness, into an experience. We're here to offer an opportunity so that people may transform their heart. That's what we're here for. That's why we have been in a series of inviting people. So going back to the empty chair. It's not just an empty chair, right? It's an opportunity. It's an opportunity for us to go out and to invite people, to, to, to be authentic with our experiences if you are a Christ follower. And if you're not a Christ follower, I have good news for you. You are getting some insider information to what life is like. If you're new in the faith and you might not be as prepared or you don't feel as equipped to go out and, and to start inviting people, I want you to be encouraged. It is okay. It is okay. Everybody is a beginner at something new. Babe Ruth did not start hitting home runs when he was 12 years old. And so it is okay to fumble. It is okay to not know every word. It's okay to feel a little unprepared. That's why we have been giving out some of these tools of people or of names that you can write down and say, hey, I want to pray for these conversations. I want to pray for, the, for these relationships. I want to pray for these conversations in the workplace or at the gym or in my friend community. And then we have a little ticket that says, hey, uh, just come and visit with us next Sunday, August 22nd. It is going to be an incredible experience. When we're inviting people, we're not inviting them to a social invite. This is not something that is just a weekend thing. When we're inviting people, when, we are when we're being authentic about our experiences with Christ, we are inviting them to an opportunity to hear the message of, of the gospel the message that brings life transformation and can fix any broken situation. So, what are we going to do? It takes some personal responsibility to take up this opportunity, to fill a representation. Let's pray. Dear God, we thank you for the opportunity to be able to come together and to worship Lord, we thank you for this series of inviting people in. God, we pray for the conversations and for the situations this upcoming week that you might give us an open eye and open ears, Lord, to be able to hear those conversations that we have. Lord, we, we, we have been praying over the names on these cards and we continue to pray over those names on those cards. Lord, give us the boldness and the courage to step out in faith. Let us be authentic, Lord. Let the people that we have conversations with may, ex may hear our experience and, and to find something in that that they want. Lord, we pray for our work situations, for our friend groups, that they might be open and willing to hear something new. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <laughs>